In 1993, I was writing a book called Seeds of Change about the loss of seed diversity and the company of the same name that I had co-founded. Um, the last part of the book was about growing a mission-driven enterprise, and as I was writing, I had a visitation. It was from an entrepreneurial shaman, a sort of Don Juan of social ventures. He had sage counsel for me. Given the, the magnitude of today's economic crisis, I figured it was time to check back in with Ben. His name is Ben Dover. He's seen it all. So I asked Ben, what's going on here? This investigative journalist, Naomi Klein, calls it disaster capitalism, and it's a disaster, all right. Ben chuckled. It's the oldest racket in town. It takes me back to the glory days of the old robber barons. They wrote the playbook, real visionaries. Old Baron von Rothschild, the banker, he used to tell me, when the streets run red with blood, I buy. Or take Collis Huntington, the railroad baron. You know his motto? Anything that's not nailed down is mine, and anything I can pry loose is not nailed down. <laughs> There's your basic corporate mission statement. <laughs> Collis cornered the market on transportation and then charged all that the traffic would bear. Free market? Not if he could help it. Went to D.C. with a suitcase full of cash and bought senators like he bought railroad ties. Wrote Uncle Sam's legislation word for word. Made a killing. Like I said, visionaries. So I asked Ben, didn't all that change, you know, with the progressive era and the New Deal? And Ben spat into the etheric spittoon. He's old school. That's rich, he said. What changed was the labor movement put the fear of God into them. The whole working class was up in arms screaming bloody revolution. Then comes the Russian Revolution. All this put them in a very tough spot politically. So they invented three things. The first was regulation. It legalized their shenanigans after the fact. The next was public relations. They were hated in their time. PR laundered their image, made them socially acceptable. Then they came up with philanthropy, worked like a charm. Nothing else much changed until Roosevelt and the New Deal. That really freaked them out. They never forgave the government for social spending and cutting into their government gravy train. Government, that's where the really big money is, and they've been scheming ever since to get it all back. Crisis is their favorite political cover. People let crazy stuff go down when they're scared. So what are we going to do? I asked Ben. He sighed and looked me deep in the eye. I warned him. Crisis only gets you so far. Eventually it blows up in your face. You get bloody revolutions. You need a police state and a big army. It's very unstable. The cost of doing business just gets too high. And then democracy breaks out, just like today. So here we are in the ruins of disaster capitalism. Calling it unsustainable would be polite. The biggest shock is it got this far. Now don't get me wrong, I'm all for the free market. We should try it. <laughs> And please give my regards to Naomi. I love her work, visionary. So that's what Ben transmitted to us here today. <laughs>
I, what I love about Kenny's introductions is it really takes the pressure off me because he sort of says all the big stuff and I can just kind of relax and riff a little bit. It's such an honor to share this beautiful stage with so many incredibly talented, gorgeous, visionary people. Um, I think you're probably expecting me to just give you a lot of really bad news. After all, I am the disaster capitalism girl. Um, I want to start with some good news for a change. Um, if you are part of a movement for deep ecological change, for deep ecological justice, and I know that if you aren't, you're probably in the wrong room. Um, if you are part of a movement like that, um, that understands the changes that we need in order to radically change course and save our planet, save our humanity, if you understand the changes but have been told over and over again that the resources aren't there, um, the resources aren't there. We can't afford the change that is needed. But if you are part of a movement where you have actually been part of that change on a small scale and you know it isn't a crazy dream because you have tasted it and you have smelled it and you have lived it and it's just a question of taking that to scale and all you need are some real resources to back up that process. If you're part of a movement like that, there are worse things that can happen than waking up one morning and find out, finding out that you own the banks, okay? <laughs> that is a little bit, you know, they keep calling it a crisis, right? You guys own Goldman Sachs, has that hit you yet? <laughs> you own Citibank, have you got that? Um, now, they're bad deals, and I'm going to come to that. Um, but this is important to understand. Um, this strange phenomenon of waking up and realizing that the banks have been partially nationalized, it's happened in this country, it happened on Monday. Um, it happened on Monday because they'd already done it in Britain, uh, and they did it across the European Union. Um, and that seemed like a better idea uh, than just taking the toxic debts that were detonating on Wall Street and bringing what Warren Buffett called uh, uh, e economic weapons of mass destruction, right, these bad debts, and bringing them to Washington to blow up the government, right, to blow up the public resources. That was plan A, all right, that was the Paulson plan. Um, and, uh, and you know, what was funny about the Paulson plan is after Bush, who I call the extortionist in chief, you know, he, I, ca I started calling him the extortionist in chief even before he went on national television and said, give me $700 billion or we're all going to die, right? This, you know, this extortion, this is his main posture as president, right? You know, we, we, certainly we saw it in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq, but, you know, we saw it earlier this summer when they were making their case for offshore oil drilling, right? If, if we're not allowed to, to drill offshore, if Congress won't give me that power, you know, no one's going to be able to go on their summer vacations because the price of gas will be too high. Um, so he, I was calling him the extortionist in chief back then. Um, but uh, they've taken it to new heights. So they got what they wanted. They got their $700 billion, no strings attached, to buy up those toxic debts move them from Wall Street to Washington. But the funny thing was is that the market didn't like it. It was the market that issued its verdict on this plan by plummeting, right? And that's why they had to change course and adopt what people were calling the Brown Plan, the Gordon Brown Plan of bank nationalizations. Um, so the other part of this moment that I think is really important for us to understand is that if you have grown up in an era, as everybody under 40 in this room has, being told that government is the problem, not the solution, and in fact that there's something wrong with the very idea of collective action, whether it's movements or trade unions, God forbid, government action, um, that every change that's meaningful is only individual action or market-based solutions, the fact that we are witnessing 
right? This incredibly enthusiastic, uh, focused intervention uh, on the part of governments around the world to save the banks. I actually wanted to get a t-shirt made, save the banks. Um, <laughs> that this is, you know, this really screws with their argument. <laughs> the argument against mobilization, against movement building, the demobilizing argument of our time. There is no such thing as society. So we need to recognize the moment we're living in right now. It is a historic moment. We partially own the banks, okay? And the idea that the state can't do anything to solve our problems has just been exposed on a massive scale, right? I mean, AIG got $85 billion, and then that wasn't enough. Well, then they went to a spa and spent $23,000 just on spa treatments. Um, and then they got another $37 billion of taxpayer money. That could get health care to every child in this country. That is what is unfolding before our eyes. Um, now, that's the kind of good news, all right? <laughs> The bad news is that the way in which they're rescuing the banks is still the equivalent of taking weapons of mass destruction and blowing up the government. We are rescuing the banks and potentially killing ourselves because of the way this is playing out. And so I know this isn't necessarily what you had planned to focus on at this conference, but it really is worth spending a little bit of time focusing on the fine print of the deals that are being negotiated right now at the Treasury, at the Federal Reserve, because it is going to impact the possibilities of the future, the possibilities of an Obama presidency, the possibilities of making the dreams that are being dreamt here possible in the future. These are bad deals. They don't have to be. And one of the things that we have seen in this remarkable month, okay, you know, I, I, as Kenny, you know, talked about the, 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 the new book, uh, or the newish book, is about what happens under cover of crisis. And I have a quote in the Shock Doctrine from a, a human rights activist in Poland in 1989 talking about the speed of change in that country when the, they, they had historic elections, the first Eastern Bloc country to have elections. They threw out the communists, brought in solidarity. They were in the middle of an economic crisis. They got shock therapy instead of what they'd voted for. She said, we're living in dog years. That, that, that's the speed we're living in right now. We're living in dog years. So it even feels weird you know, to talk about a month, right? Or to say they nationalized the banks on Monday. I mean, things are moving so quickly. Um, but, but, but we do need to understand uh, the nature of these deals. And um, let me talk a little bit about that. Now, they, as I said, they had to, um, to switch course from plan A, which was taking the debts, to this plan B of partial nationalization. It's very important for people to understand that they have not abandoned plan A. They're just doing both, okay? So they're continuing with this outrageous subsidy that every serious economist in the world has said makes absolutely no sense. All it is is a continuation of what we've seen from this administration consistently, which is crony capitalism, okay? Where they spend seven years, the first seven years of this administration, transferring public money into private hands through the form of these no-bid contracts and building this parallel government, the Blackwater-Halliburton economy. There's nothing free market about it. It's about who you know. It's about the lobbyists you've paid. And it's just paying contractors to do the job of government at a profit, okay? That is the true legacy of this administration. And now as their final gift, they are privatizing, they are, they are nationalizing the bad debts of the corporate sector, taking those private debts and making them public debts, okay? They haven't abandoned that part of the plan. 
But, you know, talking about dog years, what, the reason why I think it's worth focusing on this is because the public has already had an impact on this discussion. And the fact that we're even able to change course and go to this equity model as opposed to this toxic debt model just taking on the debts is because there was an incredible uprising in this country. Um, nobody organized it. It was spontaneous. It was grassroots. And that happened after the original bailout was announced. Both political parties lined up against it. Both major candidates for president endorsed it. But the people said no, even though CNN was selling it harder than they had sold anything since the Iraq War, saying this is not a bailout for Wall Street, it's a bailout for Main Street. We really have to get behind this. People called their Congress people. 99% of the calls said don't bail them out. This is a bad deal, right? <laughs> and it was a shocker. It was a shocker, but Congress voted originally against that bailout. They voted against it, and the New York Times broke it down, and they found out that the Congress people who voted against the bailout were overwhelmingly in very tight races, i.e. they were fighting for their jobs, i.e. they found themselves um, uncharacteristically interested in the opinions <laughs> of their constituents, right? And so then all, there was all of this patronizing, but of course we look at it now and it turns out that those silly people were right. It was a bad deal. And now everybody admits that it was a bad deal, right? So there, there is a period, especially during an election, when there is an opportunity to influence this debate. And I know everybody's focused on just getting out the vote, but you know the, the, the reverberations from what happened in this period radically will affect what the next administration is able to do. So a little bit of time in this key moment is really worth spending um, making sure that actually we continue this process and say, no, none of that public money should be spent buying those bad debts in a plan that has already been discredited. Right now, they're still talking about spending hundreds of billions of dollars doing just that, turning the government into a hedge fund buying up bad debts that the banks don't want and selling them and claiming maybe you'll, they'll make a profit. Is that insane? If you could make a profit, the banks wouldn't want to be unloading them, okay? The only way this can work as a bailout is if they overprice those assets. So then they turn around and they say, oh, but you know what? We can't really do this because we're a government, not a hedge fund, even though it's very hard to tell the difference between Goldman Sachs and the Treasury Department. Um, so they say we have to outsource it just like the invasion of Iraq, but we're in a really big rush, so we can't actually have open bidding. And they gave the companies two days to get their contracts together, to get their applications together, for the contracts to run this huge hedge fund. Okay, so essentially what they've done is they have merged, or in a way outsourced, the Treasury to Wall Street. This whole thing stinks. It's a very bad deal. It is crony capitalism at its worst. The market has voted against it, and people need to tell their Congress people that they were right the first time, um, and they need to kill this deal for good. Um, so please do that. The other thing that needs to happen now that the partial nationalizations are taking place is you guys need to read the fine print on this, all right? Paulson announces that the reason why they're injecting 100, first of all, I don't know if you followed this, but the, but the narrative that you read in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, about what happened on Monday was that Henry Paulson, former CEO of Goldman Sachs, used to be known as Mr. Risk, by the way, because he personally ran up the debt at Goldman Sachs from 20 billion in 1999 to 100 billion, okay? So when he talks about buying up these bad debts, it's his own debts, okay? Um, so he gets together with the nine CEOs of the biggest banks on Monday, and according to all the mainstream media accounts, just twisted their arms, appealed to their patriotism, he was so tough with them, and he told them, you have to take $125 billion of taxpayer money, and you don't have a choice, all right? 
And he got those banks to agree to that, if you can believe it. Those failing banks, those banks were, which were two days away uh, from announcing uh, that they had wiped out their entire profits for the past six years. Okay, so $125 billion cash injection is kind of nice when you're about to tell shareholders um, that you uh, report a record loss like that. So what I love about this story about Henry Paulson twisting the arms of the banks is that if you actually do the calculation, the meeting started at three, it ended at four, and they had sandwiches. They had, they, they had lunch, all right? So this was a meet, nine banks agreed to partial nationalization is what they were calling it, um, in one hour, and they had time for, for sandwiches. Um, <laughs> That, that happens when you have a deal that is so sweet for those banks, okay, uh, that they couldn't have written a better deal for themselves. Now, what's so shocking about this is that just two weeks earlier, Gordon Brown had done the same thing, and he had gotten 15% um, return for UK shareholders um, on their equity buys, um, and voting rights, the right to control these banks, right? Well, Henry Paulson got 5%, Mr. Tough Guy, um, and no voting rights, no power, right? So what's happening now is that the public is taking on the risk, but none of the power. So this is what needs to change, okay? This is the message that, that uh, politicians need to hear loud and clear, including presidential candidates, uh, that if people are taking on the risk, if taxpayers are taking on the risk of these banks, then we also want control over these banks that have lost the right to be trusted because they imploded the entire financial architecture and they are bankrupt. They are bankrupt. So you don't need to pay good money for them. It's a favor to take them over, okay? And, um, you know, what, what are the conditions? You know, when the International Monetary Fund goes in with a bailout for, for a country, they come with a list of conditions. It's called structural adjustment, okay? So I think we should start thinking like a People's International Monetary Fund and think about what's our structural adjustment that we want to impose on the financial industry. Now that, you know, and it has to go beyond things like CEO pay. Um, it has to go much deeper than that. This is where we can have the discussion that you're having here today about what is real prosperity, what is real value, what do we want to invest in. That's what I mean by it's not such bad news that you could have control over the banks if we can just get past the ideology, which the Republicans have already gotten past. Um, so let's catch up. Um, so. Um, the reason why the stakes are so high in this period is that um, the way I've been thinking about what they're doing here uh, in, in, in taking on these huge uh, public debts to save the financial sector, and it goes beyond the $700 billion. They're well, if, 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 they, if the banks were to call in everything that has been thrown at them, if we count you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, AIG, the $700 billion plus stuff that hasn't really gotten very much attention, which are these unlimited guarantees that have been given to the banks to guarantee their lending, using public money to guarantee their lending. If all of that gets pulled in, we're talking about trillions of dollars. Five trillion do dollars is what the New York Times is estimating if all of this was called in, okay? Um, think about this as the Republicans' insurance policy against an Obama presidency and against the kind of hope that he is awakening in a generation of supporters. And that's what's more important, in a way, than what Obama is promising on the campaign trail. It's the deeper message that is resonating with people, which is that it is possible to build, it is possible to invest in people, it is possible to invest in green infrastructure, it's possible to change. That idea, that yes we can message, turns in an instant into no you can't, right? Because let me tell you something, they may have abandoned their free market ideology when it is convenient, when it is convenient for the corporate elites, but they will find their faith. They will refine their faith as soon as these elections are over, and it is useful to argue against Obama's very weak health care plan 
against uh, Obama's very weak green energy plan. And our job, of course, is to change that green energy plan into a real green energy plan, get nuclear and coal out of it, get more wind and solar into it. So let's engage in a little pattern recognition here, all right? We know this pattern, we know this story, we have lived this story. We know that economic crises are used by the right, okay, to push through their regressive policies. They'll say we can't afford to invest in green energy, we can only afford short-term solutions that will be a stimulus to business, like tax cuts, which by the way, they've already bundled along with this terrible bailout hundreds of billions of dollars of tax cuts, but they want more. They want a holiday on capital gains taxes. Oh, and they want to drill baby drill. That's a real, uh, that's, that's a real short term injection. Um, and, you know, I, in, in my book, I, I start with a quote from Milton Friedman uh, that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, the change depends on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, he says, to keep the ideas ready until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. They've been at this for 35 years, all right? If we want to know what they're going to do, just look at the ideas that are lying around. They want the, you know, they want the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. They want to get rid of capital gains taxes. They want to get rid of the post-Enron regulations. So in the midst of a crisis born of deregulation, they're busy lobbying frantically for less regulation. It's happening. So what are our ideas lying around? And are we willing to fight for them with the same enthusiasm in this moment as the lobbyists, as the right-wing think tanks, who I call the people paid to think by the makers of tanks, are we willing to fight as hard as them? That is... We have opportunities here. We have opportunities here. When the right abandons its own rhetoric, because it was always a cover story anyway, okay, that is an opening for us. You know, trickle down, laissez faire, it was useful when the bubbles were inflating, right? When you wanted government to turn around and allow these incredibly lucrative bubbles to inflate. Um, it's not useful and gets handily and immediately abandoned when you want the government to intervene on behalf of those same corporations. And we know that the, it's not that they're against regulation, right? They're against regulation that stands in the way of their ability to accumulate profit, and they are for regulation uh, that protects those profits, like intellectual property protections on life-saving drugs and on seeds. And that's what free trade agreements are for, and that's what the World Trade Organization is for. We have an opportunity because that whole financial architecture is in crisis right now. The World Trade Organization hasn't been able to get its talks back on track. The International Monetary Fund is discredited, but suddenly we're seeing governments cooperating internationally to save the banks. So why can't they cooperate internationally to close the tax havens, to impose a Tobin tax on currency speculation? Why can't we be demanding of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank that in this moment the Washington consensus is dead, there will be no structural adjustment conditions uh, attached to any loans that are given to countries? countries in, during this financial crisis. So now is the moment when we have to move in and we, you know, we can't wait until the right gets reorganized and starts making their austerity arguments uh, to an Obama presidency. I realize I'm making some assumptions here. Um, we need to put the whole idea of privatization on trial now. It's a gimme, right? I mean, who is pushing for the privatization of essential services like water, bridges, roads? It's these same banks. They're the ones who have been pushing for it. They call it the next bubble, the infrastructure bubble. We've never had a better time to say to the public, do you really think it's a good idea to put more things that are too important to fail in the hands of this reckless casino? We have our arguments made for us, okay, by reality. Um, we, another opportunity we have 
going up to, to, to Copenhagen and thinking about a post-Kyoto consensus is to expose the insanity of leaving the biggest crisis of our time, which is not the financial crisis, but is the global climate crisis, the crisis of global warming in the hands of the market, market-based solutions, right? That's what they're serving up, carbon trading, right, green venture capital. This is not a solution. We cannot leave this to the market. We have to have the kind of marshalling of resources and leadership that we have seen to save the banks, okay? Because what is going to happen is that, that the crisis of saving Wall Street is going to be used to tell us that our dreams aren't possible. When they tell us that we can't afford it, tell them that Exxon made $40 billion in profits last year. And if we can nationalize the banks, hey, I say the oil companies should watch their backs. This is, this is a moment of possibility. All right? We can be defeated only by our tentativeness. Barack Obama is a centrist. He is really, really good at being a centrist. He's never claimed to be anything else. He finds the center and he goes there. So what do we do? Move the center. Thank you.